In fact, Arnaud promised the mother and father of Celine that he would take care of the business and give them a cut after he bought out two thirds of their shares, but of course, eventually he chased them out. Today, in part two of democratization of couture, we will be talking about the globalization after Recamier and Bernard Arnault. How and why did it happen? Stick around to find out. Welcome! If you love couture style analysis, aka CSA, then like, comment, sub, and ring that doorbell to get notifications of a weekly CSA PSA hot off the press. I've been reading Deluxe How Luxury Lost Its Luster by Dana Thomas. I formalized a lot of things about the globalization of luxury after it became public from the small founders' time. Without further ado, let's jump into how that happened. Target audience. The primary customers of the luxury groups are still the upper income people. Though their new democratization has been marketed to less traditional income groups, the upper and middle class. The typical ages of their target group has been 35 to 50 everywhere, but generally starting at around 25 in Asia. And Asia has actually become one of their biggest groups to target. The rich can afford luxury even during economic downturns, and they have the extra cash, but the middle classes can't afford any of this. Unstable revenue from the large and middle class group during recessions has also created an unstable source of income for the luxury group sometimes and hence have led to extra stock, which is not good for some brands, especially Louis Vuitton, who does not ever do sales. But ironically, the pandemic led LVMH and Chanel to price jump like crazy and actually the opposite happened instead of the stock plummeting the stock actually increased and demand increased instead, leading to shortages during the pandemic. Their biggest by far has become the middle class. This audience is the biggest of all the income groups. And if you were to imagine the income groups like a bell curve, you can see at the end are people below the poverty line, which starts at the lowest of the bell curve, then it gets to be below the middle class. And then the biggest group right in the smack dang center of that bell curve is the middle class, which is the middle of the bell, the upper middle class, and then the smallest group, the little pinpoint you see at the tail end. Yeah, that's the rich people. Luxury corporations say they make it accessible to democratize it. But really, who are we fooling? Come on. It's capitalism because they saw the middle class had money as well. They saw that not only did the middle class have money, like the upper class, but they were the biggest group of all of the income groups. So they knew they had to milk it somehow. And if the middle class didn't have money, then and they wouldn't have marketed the middle class in the first place, and they would still be hunting the rich in the big leagues for more expensive items. Though they still would make small amounts of profit from the middle class, such as perfume or cosmetic, who lure them into the luxury world, they still would make some profits. So even though they, even if they didn't market as hard as they do now to the current middle class, they would still make small items like perfume slash cosmetics in order to lure them into the world of luxury. Because smaller items such as perfume or cosmetics give people a piece of the dream that they can actually afford at a lower price point of $100, $100 rather than $1,000. Because most of the middle class can't drop six figures on a haute couture dress, but they certainly can drop $60 on Chanel lipstick if they ever chose. Democratization equals money. Luxury companies listed themselves on the public trading platforms in order to one, raise money from stocks being built, two, gain more status and recognition as one of the few pros of that. But also the cons is that they were more subject to the demands of stockholders, which want profit increases from them every quarter or every three months, which is crazy to think that they would want an increase in profit every three months. Because sometimes you can't even churn out items fast enough, let alone plan all of that. And because of this pressure, they have to create faster growth and it is difficult for them to attain a new high constantly, hence also cutting corners in quality, which everyone complains about in the luxury world. Sadly, because of this shift from small mom and pop boutiques, which focused on the quality of the items to this now greedy, profit-driven world, it's become very capitalistic because of the nature of their shareholders. And these companies are driven into being more money hungry by the pressure of their stockholders. Also because of the fact that they do want more profit, of course, but I believe it's also because of the shareholders that they've had to become more ruthless and more strategic and manipulative to get more of our money. To understand 
said why they saw the middle market as a cash cow to fulfill stockholders' needs. Tom Ford once said, It makes you make short-term decisions to please them and balance long-term goals with immediate short-term goals. Which is very unsustainable, in my opinion, because it leads to faster and faster output, which is not really necessary sometimes. Because sometimes you just want to, hey, slow down and appreciate the quality that you're making and make sure it's right before you release it out. But no, they can't do that because they're under this increasing pressure by the stockholders. And it's kind of ridiculous to the point where even Chanel has six seasons for collections every year when only four seasons actually exist in a year. There's 12 months in a year and if you're coming out with six seasons every year you can bet that, that they're only releasing six collections every year probably because shareholders are creating this intense amount of pressure on them and it's crazy to think that in some luxury brands such as Chanel which have six collections in a year if you divide that by 12 months that just means that each season is just two months long. If you think about it, if it takes a month for the item to be in the boutique and there's a hubbub of craze to get the item in the first month and you try to get the bag because of FOMO, fear of missing out, after about a month when you finally get the bag and enjoy it that month after, in the second month, and you get to wear it out with your outfits for a month, you enjoy it and you post it on social media, you then learn the new collection is coming out in the third month, which is the next month, but then and the next collection comes out in the next month. And in the span of two months, you've only gotten to enjoy your new bag before you're already seeing the new collection come out and then you lust after that bag again in the next collection. And so it's just very unsustainable because it creates this process of wanting and getting and wanting and getting constantly. It's unsustainable. The fear of missing out is unsustainable and these luxury brands know it. And so that's why they keep creating these new collections in such short time period. But that is another can of worms, another topic for another day. If you're interested in me talking about it, leave a comment in the section below. To meet profits, luxury companies have really cut corners, materials, and they've even outsourced labor to developing countries, though they'll never actually tell you that. More money equals more production. More production doesn't necessarily equal handmade, yet more production equals machine-made items. And hence, every single brand now creates items made via a machine, except for Hermes. Chanel especially has had a lot of quality issues since they started making things faster or more efficiently, and especially with the price increases, their quality has been lost. Ever since 2008, they've stopped gold plating their hardware, and even LV gets complaints about the pochette Matisse with their glazing. With the rise of quality issues and the decrease of quality, Hermes is still the only luxury handbag company who actually makes bags by hand, making many smaller amounts than LV, who is the mass production king, but they still make their bags two to five times more expensive than how much LV bag costs. And even with the price markup, where one Hermes bag equals a few LV bags in sale, LV makes way more revenue yearly. See here in these pics. And quantity to them means more dough. And take a moment to consider the lack of quality control because of decisions to maximize profits for shareholders because when they cut corners it means more profits for them and with more profit it means they have more happy shareholders who continue to buy stocks in their company so happy shareholders equal more shares and more shares equals more fundings for the brands and more status mcdonald's is, is available in different countries known to different ethnicities races and many economic class, much like lvmh and it is truly democratic in accessibility to the public and LV LVMH in How Luxury Lost Its Luster by Dana Thomas is compared to McDonald's as a globally far-reaching and widely recognizable company because it also has locations in multiple countries. It is reaching many different races because I've literally seen everyone wearing LV, no matter their ethnicity or their, no matter their race. And I've also heard LV being very popular overseas in Asia, as well as Europe, as well as in the US, as well as other countries. It's very far-reaching. So, in a way, LV is like McDonald's of the luxury world. LVMH Empire under Bernard Arnault Louis Vuitton and Mohé Hennessy, run by Bernard Arnault, made him the 7th richest man in 2006, according to Forbes, and he was worth $21 billion at 
that time. LVMH is a conglomerate of over 50 brands, and in order to achieve that, are no swallowed up brands such as Givenchy, by Uber de Givenchy, Tagua, and Celine. In fact, Arnaud promised the mother and father of Celine that he would take care of the business and give them a cut after he bought out two thirds of their shares, but of course, eventually he chased them out. Sorry, mom and pop. He told Celine and Richard, the founders, that, oh, run along, old grandma and granny. You should take a rest now and let me take over. You need a vacation. You're not suited for this work anymore. Ouch. Bernard is horrible because Marcamier, who bought out Givenchy from owner Hubert de Givenchy, allowed him to remain designer until retirement. And Marcamier at least did him a favor that way. But Arnaud is horrible because he basically chased out the founders of Celine because he wanted their brand to remain in his list and he was able to weasel his way into getting them to sign it over and just drop them like the drop of the hat when he had them. How rude. Bercamier introduced LV to corporate, yet Arnaud was the one who actually globalized and conglomerated it into a luxury group. Bercamier seeked Arnaud to help with LVMH and his sole objective was growth and did not care about the old values of Louis Vuitton or anything at all. He had basically no attachment to the company. Arnaud wanted to conquer brands to make a profit, so he acquired Dior, Burberry, and Gucci. Luxury was run by sole designers back then who cared about profit margins of course but more over that their second biggest priority was the quality of the items they were producing but now all it is these days in luxury with the globalization has just become about how to profit from it not even just about quality anymore luxury has become about the objects as icons and it's not anymore about what the items are but what they represent which is a pigmentation in the mind that really explains a lot now because people will buy really ugly luxury items because of what the status is and not because of what they are. And not all of us are completely immune to this, but to a certain extent we understand that it's not worth buying a $40 supreme brick. Like, come on! It's just a brick. Yet some people will buy that and they will resell them for over $200. Another can of worms. To show you how tenacious Bernard Arnault is, LVMH had already owned Parfums, Christian Dior, and he wanted Dior. Yet Dior was owned by the Société Foncière et Financière Agache Rouleau, but the French government told him, hey, you gotta buy Agache Rouleau. You can't just buy Dior. He was like, uh-huh, I am going to get Dior, no matter what. So he used his connections and money to raise the money to buy it. And he had connections to the Willows because his wife was a distant cousin. Like rich bougie people they are, he would attend art sightings and he would see them at auction. So that's how he was able to leverage his power to talk to them. He also, he convinced Lazare Frere, Lazare Frere, an investment bank who actually had close ties to the French government, to loan him $80 million, which was a majority of the purchase price, and became a powerful person capable enough to be in a position to buy it. If, if I see it, I like it, I want it, I got it. And that's exactly what it, what he got. He actually accomplished acquiring Dior by acquiring a gosh below. I highly recommend picking up How Luxury Lost Its Lust. You won't regret it and was very eye-opening. Now I have a question for you. Is it truly democratization for the people or do you think it's actually capitalism? Leave me your thoughts in the comments down below. Bye!